So this is one significant development that has taken place in the recent past. And as he was outlining his agenda, it is multidimensional. It is very reassuring that he would work with all stakeholders to craft a policy that would be effective and efficacious. When we met after he assumed the office of the chairman of the parliamentary committee, he said that his first observation was that on Kashmir people were working in silos, although they were working very efficiently and outperforming each other, but there was no synergy. That he would be the catalyst for that synergy and his committee would be the catalyst for that synergy. So thank you so much for creating that synergy. Second, all of you who are sitting here today with smiling faces, um, all of you are healthy and all of you are safe from COVID-19 pandemic. Let me take you to the Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Life is different there. If you want to imagine the Indian occupied territory, you'll have to think of Hungary during the Second World War, Poland during the Second World War, the Balkans in the 1990s, Palestine throughout these years, because in the Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and genocide are being committed. And I do not want to go into details, but I just want to delineate the picture of the Kashmir that we're talking about. It is a land where people have been deprived of all their rights. Their right to life, their right to education, to health, their life for survival. Their land is being snatched from them and Indians are changing the nation, which would be euphemistically called changing demographic composition. But when you talk about changing demographic composition, what it really means, that millions of Hindus from all over India are being imported and implanted in the land of the people of Jammu and Kashmir, and the people of Jammu and Kashmir are being marginalized. Every day, the people of Jammu and Kashmir are being killed, maimed, blinded, tortured, incarcerated, forcibly disappeared, and their women are being dishonored and raped. This is what is happening there. Imagine such monstrosities take place in Karachi or Lahore or Peshawar or Islamabad or Quetta or Muzaffarabad or Gilgit, what would be your feelings? And if in our own cities, in an, our own homeland, if there was an invasion of 900,000 soldiers who did not believe in any law and that they would brutalize you, what would be your reaction? I am giving you these graphic details because when we talk about Kashmir, we think that it's a distant land. That yes, we have a claim over the territory and our destinies are tied with the people of Jammu and Kashmir, but they are distant. They are not distant. The point that I want to make, it, make is that these people are part of your body politics that these people are you as a matter of fact. There is no distinction between the people of Jammu and Kashmir and Pakistan. And let me tell you, if you go back to history, 1947, in 1947, the people of Jammu and Kashmir decided en masse that they would be part of Pakistan. And that political will of the people was obstructed by Lord Mountbatten, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, and later on by the international community. And the people of Jammu and Kashmir are being massacred because of their desire and aspiration to be part of Pakistan. There is no other sin that they have committed. 
This point needs to be understood. Second, the Security Council hasn't moved. It hasn't produced a presidential statement, not to speak of a resolution. The behind the scenes, behind the scenes deliberations have remained non-productive. And I can show him, I know for a fact that uh, Foreign Minister of Pakistan and also the Foreign Secretary, they have sent communication after communication invoking all these articles of the Charter. And they have also furnished the evidence that is there about land grab and settled colonialism and about changing the demography of the region. But nothing has happened. Why? Because the United States, United Kingdom, France, Russian Federation, they haven't moved. They haven't moved. And that creates a new situation for us. Because what we witness is unilateralism for India, exceptionalism for India, which used to be reserved for the United States of America because it presented itself as the preeminent nation, a nation above the law. India also wants to project and present itself as a nation above the law. Now, <clears throat> let me also tell you that India's onslaught on the Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir is full spectrum. It has all the facets. It has a military facet. It has a political pincer. It has a diplomatic pincer. It has a communication pincer. It has an economic pincer. Now the point that I want to make here to this informed audience is that we are relying only on political and diplomatic pincers. So there's a disequilibrium which needs to be rectified. And therefore, we need to revisit our policy and our strategy because India has invaded the territory. It's a military invasion that has taken place. And uh, just by knocking on the doors of the United Nations Security Council or Human Rights Council, shall we get justice for the people of Jammu and Kashmir? I don't think so. Frankly speaking, I don't think so. Because the current world order favors India. Because the current world order, dominated and led by the West, says that they have to stop and stall the progress of China and that they would use India as a piece on the chessboard of international politics. This is Pakistan Observer. Visit our YouTube channel for more informative videos. Thank you.